Welcome to EC203. This is lecture six. Uh, this lecture we're going to discuss the fundamentals of noise. So if you're following along at home in the book, uh, I do recommend reading the two chapters on noise in the Sarpeshkar text. Uh, chapters seven and eight uh, are the chapters you'll want to read. Uh, they are uh, uh, particularly, I believe, good treatments of noise. Uh, it's definitely worth your, your read, even if you are uh, already have taken noise uh, in other analog integrated circuit design classes. It's still a good read the way that, that he treats some of the material. So when we talk about noise, what do we mean? Uh, well, uh, you know, when we measure essentially anything, we're never getting an infinite signal to noise ratio. There's always some amount of uncertainty in the measurement we're taking. This uncertainty can come from many different uh, sources. Uh, and the source that we're going to discuss uh, today is noise. Now, noise is something that you've all seen and experienced before, uh, perhaps even if you didn't uh, know about it. Um, and uh, anytime you hook up a, tr uh, a probe to an oscilloscope and you measure even just a DC value on the oscilloscope, you're going to see noise in that value. Okay, um, And this is eff effectively, for a voltage trace on an oscilloscope, related to the width or the fuzz uh, around this this one line, right? So you're supposed to be measuring, let's say, a, a DC voltage of one volt, but it's not a perfectly narrow, infinitesimally narrow line across the oscilloscope screen right at one volt. It has a DC value at one volt, but then it has some width around it. And that width is because of noise, okay? So we can model this. We can say that the average or the mean of the signal is what we would call the DC voltage of the signal. And the amount of noise is described by the variance. Okay, so the variance is given by this equation here. This is called the variance. And this is uh, uh, perhaps what you might want to call it is the width of the fuzz. Okay, so, so if you're looking at a trace on an oscilloscope and you see a very thick trace, chances are that tr trace has a lot of noise associated with it. And if you see a very thin trace that has a low variance, you're very close to the, to the mean or the DC vo voltage, uh, that's going to have what we would consider less noise. So it's up to us as analog designers to, to make sure that we understand what this noise means how it impacts our circuit performance, where it comes from, and how we can hopefully optimize uh, to reduce uh, the impact uh, of noise as it relates to the overall performance of our circuit. So what is noise and why do we care? Well, uh, first, why do we care? Well, it ultimately limits the performance of all analog systems. It limits the number of bits that we can get in an analog to digital converter. It limits even the maximum gain we can have on an amplifier, right? Uh, normally, or when we design amplifiers, we have a fixed power supply voltage, and the gain can't be higher than the power supply voltage divided by the input referred noise. Uh, otherwise, the amplifier would take a signal that is of equal value to its noise, and the noise itself would amplify all the way up to the rails and saturate the amplifier. So the maximum gain of any amplifier is actually given by the power supply voltage it's working over divided by the input referred noise. And we'll understand uh, momentarily what input referred noise means uh, momentarily. It limits the dynamic range and uh, basically, you know, any you know, high level performance aspect of an analog system, noise is a major limiter. Okay. Now for biomedical and wearable and implantable systems, we tend to want to have low power. Power is equal to current times voltage. Uh, and so as a result, to get low power, we typically want low voltage and low currents. But as we'll see, unfortunately, low currents in particular tend to result in higher noise. All right, so that's uh, a problem. This is a, actually a fundamental trade-off that we have to play as biomedical designers to make sure that we have the appropriate amount of noise for our system while consuming the lowest amount of current possible and ultimately the lowest amount of power possible. 
So in order to make these um, trade-off analyses and so on, we really have to have a deep understanding of where noise comes from and therefore how we can or what we can do to optimize it. So what is noise and why does it happen? All right, well, noise, as it turns out, basically comes from the um, quantized nature of uh, electron transport in semiconductors and um, you know resistors and so on. So we tend to pretend that current flow is a nice smooth flow of, of current. But in actuality, current is, is, do, is occurring due to the movement of charged particles. And these charged particles, typically electrons, are discrete things, right? You have one electron, right? And each time an electron crosses into, say, a resistor or into a transistor or something like this, this will ultimately change the observable uh, behavior or, or the, 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 the observable voltage or current across that element in a very logical manner. Okay, and so it turns out that uh, we can model the arrival time of electrons or charged particles across say the barrier of some circuit element as measured by a detector with uh, some Poisson statistics. Okay, so every time a electron crosses the barrier, there's some probability that, that, that this happens and we can model this as Poisson. This is fundamentally the basis for what we would call shot noise. Okay, so uh, just to uh, do a little bit of writing here, the um, total flow or the average is what we would call the current. And the uncorrelated arrival times of electrons is what we would refer to as uh, being the noise uh, component, specifically the shot noise uh, component here. Okay, so let's let's try and quantify this a little bit. Let's assume that each electron arrives at the detector with an arrival rate lambda. And let's say that when it goes past this detector, let's say it's entering a resistor as an example, it generates some impulse response that is measurable uh, across the terminals of this resistor. So you can think of, you know, an electron goes into a, a resistor, uh, as it crosses the barrier, there's gonna be some uh, measurable impulse response that happens. Okay, it could be in a direct delta function uh, or it could be some, you know, other arbitrary function. So obviously one electrode won't just arrive, it'll be a bunch of electrodes that'll arrive uh, you know, over some period of time. And the total current uh, that we measure, the DC current that we measure is the sum of the impulse responses of each one of these events. Okay, that would be capital F of T here, uh, where lowercase f of T is one of these impulses. So that's the, or rather that's the total current, that's the I suppose I should say the instantaneous current. The mean or the DC current is, well, you would take the mean. So you'd integrate uh, from minus infinity to some time T, uh, wherever your, your instance of observation is, um, of, the, of the function um, times the average arrival rate, okay? Um, and so we can uh, massage this integral to go from uh, zero uh, to infinity uh, to make this a little easier to solve uh, again. Lambda here is the arrival rate of electrons. And in this case, F of tau, uh, we're going to say is the amount of charge. Okay, so obviously if there's a higher arrival rate, lambda, or if this impulse function, this F of T function is larger then we'll get a larger mean response, right? That makes sense. Okay, so if we have F of T and we have F bar of T, so we have the actual current response, we have the mean current response, the next step now is to derive what is the variance. That's ultimately going to say what the amount of noise uh, that we have here. <clears throat> 
So the variance can be found by computing the uh, mean of the square and, and subtracting the square of the mean. Okay, and there's some various uh, identities we can use uh, in, in our uh, analysis here to, to make this uh, simpler. Uh, ultimately, this ends up being a integral from zero to infinity of lambda times f squared of tau. Now this is in the time domain and it could be tr a little tricky to, to do this integral. Um, so we can actually take this and convert it into the frequency domain through uh, uh, Parseval. Oops, let's write that correctly. Uh, Parseval uh, allows us to do this. And by the way, this is uh, this expression is through uh, Carson and uh, Campbell's theory. Okay, uh, and then we get the the ultimately we get this following uh, uh, integral, which is two times lambda times the integral from zero to infinity of the uh, frequency domain impulse function uh, squared. All right. Now, it turns out that in diodes, BJTs, and subthreshold MOSFETs, the current, which is dominated typically by diffusion, uh, can be modeled as a Poisson function. Okay, so uh, in fact, um, the, this, um, the mean uh, of the current is given by the fundamental charge Q times lambda. Okay, so as a result for BJTs, diodes, and subthreshold MOSFETs, we can say the variance is given by Q squared times the integral of zero to infinity, two lambda times the, the um, uh, frequency domain um, uh, function here. Okay, now let's just go ahead and assume, and this is obviously not perfect, uh, but, but, but it's a good enough approximation for our, our cases that little f of t is a true impulse function. So it's a true direct delta function. And as a result, it's uh, a Fourier uh, domain uh, look is basically just um, uh, you know, unity over all frequencies. Okay, so therefore we can say that capital F of F, the, the Fourier domain version of little f uh, of t uh, is equal to one, and therefore the square of that is also equal to one. Now that of course makes our integral extremely simple. Um, the integral of one is just one. Uh, and so ultimately we say that the variance of the current flowing through a diode, BJT, or subthreshold transistor, and we can say this because it's dominated by uh, Poisson uh, or diffusion currents, which has Poisson uh, behavior, is ultimately given by two times Q, the fundamental charge, times the mean of the current times delta F. Okay, this is a very important formula. I, w I want you to memorize it. Okay, it's not a difficult formula uh, to do so. It's two times the fundamental charge Q times the mean of the current times delta F. And what delta F means here is basically the, the band over which you are performing this integral. Obviously, if we integrate one over infinite frequency, we will get infinite uh, a result, um, but that's obviously not practical. So we have to set some bounds of integration. Uh, and in fact, I think this is a really important point that we need to discuss in more detail on the next slide. So delta F is typically established by other things in our circuit. So if we have uh, an RC circuit, then the R and C will form some low pass filter or high pass filter, depending on the configuration, that will ultimately limit the amount of noise that gets integrated. After some frequency, the, the noise will be filtered out by the natural operation of the circuit. So let's just do a quick uh, thought experiment here. Let's say that we somehow have a filter in our circuit that allows delta F to go to zero. Okay, so if we're averaging over no bandwidth, um, that means we are truly, truly, truly taking effectively what that means is a, is a DC signal, which means we're averaging over infinite time. And if we average over infinite time, then our noise, at least according to the formula we derived on the previous slide, if delta F is zero, then our noise should go to zero. And actually, that makes intuitive sense. Right, if we take, uh, say, a Gaussian distribution, 
of anything, current, um, you know, anything. And we average all of the samples over and over and over again, infinite number of times, then the more we average, the more we're going to get the mean, right, with, with little variance left over. Uh, and so the more and more we average, the less noise we get. So this actually makes intuitive sense. Now, the other side of this thought experiment is what if the delta F goes to infinity? Okay, so what this means in the time domain is we're averaging over an infinitesimally small amount of time. Then, well, according to our formula, if def delta F goes to infinity, then our noise should also go to infinity. This makes a little less logical sense, um, intuitively anyways, uh, although if you think about it, it, it can start making some sense uh, because you're averaging over such a, a short period of time that the, that the variance is, is you know, enormous, it's infinite. Um, I did put a little asterisk here because in practice there are other things that ultimately limit um, uh, the, the noise bandwidth, um, and so we can of course never actually get uh, infinite noise. Of course, we can't either get zero noise uh, because we can't a uh, average over the uh, entire uh, lifetime of the universe, uh, but I think you get the idea. So the point I'm trying to make in this slide here is that it's meaningless to discuss the total amount of noise in a circuit with all, without also specifying the bandwidth. So if you come to me and say, look, professor, my circuit uh, has an input referred noise of one microvolt RMS, the, f the very first question I'm going to ask you is over what bandwidth? Because one microvolt RMS is, you know, at, at low power can be very impressive if you're doing it over 10, 20, 100 kilohertz of bandwidth, but very unimpressive if you're doing it over one hertz of bandwidth. It makes a huge difference, obviously. Now, some people to get, to get around this will say, well, I don't know what bandwidth your application ultimately needs. So let me go ahead and quote it in terms of a unit in power spectral density. So this could be volts squared per hertz um, or volts per root hertz, depending on, on how you want to do it. Um, so some people seem to um, uh, seem to prefer to do this. Uh, either is OK, uh, as, as long as you are clear in what you are describing. So one thing you might have noticed is that I said that the variance of the current uh, through a subthreshold transistor, as an example, is equal to 2qi times delta f, which implies that the amount of noise we get through a transistor actually increases with current. But earlier in the lecture, I said we typically want high current design to get low noise. So did I just contradict myself? Well, it turns out that no, both statements are correct. Um, as we have more current, we will get more noise variance, just simply because there's more electrons crossing this barrier. But that doesn't mean we have uh, more noise in our amplifier, say, because typically we'll want to do a process called input referring, which again, we'll talk about a little bit later. But perhaps a different way to, to think about this is, let's say that we want to take the uh, something called relative noise. So we want to take the ratio of the power in the noise divided by the power in the signal. Um, this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for, for DC values, but, but I think it's illustrative of what I'm trying to say here. So the power of the noise, when we talk about variance, by the way, this is a, a power unit. So we've squared things, okay? So, so which is why we talk about it as a power uh, unit, not a, a linear unit, like just a current or a voltage. So the power in the noise is what we would just call the variance. This is 2qi delta f. And the power in the signal, we would say, is the mean of the signal squared, all right, in order to get it into power units. So if we take this ratio, we get uh, 2q delta f divided by i. All right, so that what that implies is basically we have a linear relationship with uh, noise uh, power with the amount of current, and we have quadratic uh, relationship with the power of the signal. Again, doesn't totally make a whole lot of sense for a DC signal here, uh, but it's illustrative of the point. And the quadratic relationship wins, and basically our relative noise goes down as the amount of current in our circuit goes up. Okay.
Um, the intuition behind this is that you're basically, yes, you have more electrons that are crossing this barrier, but you're able to average over more of these uh, electrons. Okay. Um, so what we can say then is that uh, low noise design or low, I should, I suppose I should say signal to noise ratio or high signal to noise ratio design uses high current or low bandwidth, right? If you have low bandwidth, then you're just going to have lower noise. Okay, so let's just keep that in mind as we move forward uh, throughout our discussions on noise. So we're inev inevitably going to want to combine different sources of noise. We'll have circuits that have resistors and transistors and so on, and we're going to want to uh, figure out the noise contributions from each one of these. So we should uh, spend just a very brief moment discussing how to add random variables. So if we have random variables x and y, and they're multiplied by coefficients alpha x and alpha y, then we can say that the variance of this new variable z is the sum of the two variances multiplied by the coefficients squared. Um, now, interestingly, whether we're doing addition or subtraction, when we're doing the variance calculation, uh, it, it's always uh, an addition. Um, and it's because we're dealing with you know power units and, and, and so on. And then we have this other parameter over here, which is uh, defined as the cross correlation between these two random variables. Now this conveniently turns out to be zero if X and Y are independent from each other. And in general, if we are dealing with different circuit elements, so if we're tr trying to add the noise with a resistor and a transistor, in general, these are going to have independent, um, they're, they're going to have independent noise properties. So we can just uh, forget about the cross correlation terms. Now, as I mentioned, uh, we should make sure to always deal with uh, squared quantities when dealing with noise terms um, because we're always in this kind of power domain. So let's go ahead and talk about the noise in specific circuit elements now. Uh, let's start with the resistor. It turns out that there's two mechanisms for electrons to move within a resistor. There's drift, uh, which is caused when you apply voltage across the resistor and on average the, the electrons will move in the direction of the applied voltage. And then there's thermal velocities, uh, basically just, you know, the electrons are moving around uh, with random diffusion. And it turns out that the speed of thermal velocities are, uh, is, is much higher than that caused by drift. We're talking about 10 to the five meters per second versus, uh, you know, 10 to the minus two meters per second. A good analogy here is like a swarm of bees. Okay, so in a swarm of bees, all of the individual bees are moving around like crazy, right? But the individual, but the overall swarm might be moving very slowly in you know one direction. Uh, so that's a very good analogy. All of these individual electrons are bouncing all over the place inside the inside the resistor very very quickly, and then when you apply a voltage, it takes a long time for the whole cohort of uh, electrons to eventually move out of the resistor to be replaced with a new cohort of electrons. Interestingly, you know, when you turn on a light um, in, in a room, it actually takes uh, quite a bit of time for the electrons that were just on the other side of that switch to actually finally make it to the light bulb. But we don't have to wait that long for the light to turn on. The light turns on almost instantly uh, because all of those electrons push the other ones along the path and eventually they start flowing across the, the, the light filament. Okay, so in this in this picture, uh, as an example, we can say that we have drift acting as this kind of big force that's driving all of the uh, electrons, uh, which are these little circles here. These are electrons in one overall average direction, but individually, each electron has some um, diffusion or thermal uh, velocities associated with it that are much faster. So the assumption we're going to make here that for the purposes of noise, 
If drift is much slower than thermal diffusion, then electrons that are on the barrier of our circuit, uh, our resistor in this case, are pretty much equally likely to move to the left or the right. Okay, because the, the thermal velocities are much higher than the drift velocities. If that's the case, and we're really truly limited by diffusion for the purposes of computing noise, then noise in a resistor is really just shot noise, right? We said shot noise was coming from um, the diffusion currents in diodes, BJTs, and subthreshold MOSFETs. And in this case, we're saying that, well, actually in a resistor, we're really, for the purposes of noise, really talking about diffusion currents as well. So if that's the case, we ought to be able to model this uh, purely with a shot noise. Um, I should uh, note that most textbooks don't discuss noise in a resistor as being shot noise. They call it something else. They call it thermal noise. Uh, we'll show you in the next couple of slides that it's actually the same thing. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some uh, derivation. So if electrons are equally likely to move to the left as they are to the right, um, then we can effectively uh, compute the average, um, or not the average, the, the variance uh, of the current uh, by taking 2QI of the right uh, word current and 2QI of the leftward current, all right? Um, these two things combined together correspond to the overall current through the, um, through the resistor, okay? So there's a few uh, uh, steps in, in this derivation. Again, you can check the textbook uh, if you're interested in learning more. Uh, there is one formula that, that you're gonna need to, to compute this, this derivation. Dn uh, over mu n is equal to phi t, which is equal to kt over q. Um, and uh, for those of you who uh, recognize this, is this is the Einstein relation. And uh, I guess the other parameter here is n is in this case is not the subthreshold slope or subthreshold coefficient rather, it's the electron concentration per unit volume. Oops. Okay, so if you go through this this derivation, and again, I'm not gonna really go through the, the through the steps here. If you're interested as in learning about this, I do recommend checking out the textbook. You go through this derivation and you get the following result. The noise uh, current in a um, resistor is equal to 4kT times G, where capital G is the conductance of the device, or equivalently 4kT over R times delta F. Now, if you've studied noise before, this should look like a familiar um, term here or a familiar equation. This is exactly the same as uh, Nyquist Uh, Johnson noise, or in other words, what you would tend to call thermal noise in a resistor. So again, uh, this is just kind of a way of saying that, well, we can call it thermal noise. You can also call it shot noise because it ultimately comes from Poisson statistics and, and therefore is modeled in the same way shot noise is. Uh, ultimately, they're the same thing. Uh, the noise in a resistor is 4kT over R times delta F. Okay, in terms of a circuit model, what we would do is we would take our resistor of resistance R and we would model it as a current in parallel to this resistor, which is now modeled to be noiseless, where the variance of this current is equal to 4kT over R delta F or equivalently 4kT G delta F. Now, this is a, you know one such model. This is, a, I would suppose, the Norton equivalent model. If we wanted to transition it into a Thevenin equivalent model, we'd have to multiply the, the uh, circuit by R squared. Um, and remember, we're dealing with noise quantities here. Ohm's law must be squared. I squared is equal to V squared over R squared if we wanna do this uh, multiplication. And then what we end up getting here, and just for your notes for completeness, this would be an ideal, uh, i.e. noiseless resistor 
um, with a series voltage source of value for KTR delta F. Okay, so this is ultimately the circuit model that you will use in your analysis. Now again, you know, isn't this just the resistor's thermal noise, right? If, if you've studied noise before, um, you will have studied thermal noise, which occurs in a resistor, and it looks exactly the same. Um, and so some people uh, back in the day did confuse these two things, right? Um, they're, they're, there's certainly shot noise in a resistor. There's what we would call thermal noise in a resistor, but it turns out they're the same thing. So in other words, you don't have to make this mistake, uh, which you know some people have done in the past. The total noise is not given by the sum of shot noise and thermal noise. Um, the answer is no, because they're the same thing, okay? Um, it's really the diffusion currents that are causing the noise which is fundamentally a Poisson or governed by Poisson statistics, and therefore thermal noise is Schott's noise. So please don't double count. So we said Schott noise doesn't have a frequency component, right? It's 4kT over R times delta F, where delta F is the bounds of the integral. So does this mean that if we indeed integrate over infinite bandwidth, will we get infinite noise in a resistor? Uh, well, it turns out uh, the answer is is, is no. Um, it will eventually fall off. Okay, so just to, to plot this, if we're plotting the, the noise uh, power spectral density here, uh, it's going to be flat for a very long time over frequency, then eventually in kind of optical um, frequencies, 100 terahertz region here, it eventually kind of falls off. Um, but this is what you would refer to as being white noise. We call it white noise because it has um, an even power or a flat power spectral density across all, in this case, practical frequencies. Um, so this is what we call a white noise. That's different from other types of noise uh, that might be colored, like pink noise or brown noise and so on. We'll talk about what that means uh, later. Uh, but just, uh, just so you know, white noise basically just means it has a flat power spectral density. Now I should also point out that the uh, the distribution or the probability density function of a white noise source is typically uh, modeled as a Gaussian function. So we still have the Gaussian statistics underlying this uh, white noise source. Okay, so please also do keep that in mind. So now let's look at the noise in a subthreshold transistor. If the electric field in the subthreshold transistor is small, um, which it typically is in a subthreshold MOSFET, then we can say that the electrons are equally likely to move to the left as they are to the right. This is a very similar um, scenario as we encountered in the resistor uh, in the shot noise derivation. So we can say that there's two independent diffusion current paths uh, going left and right or forward and reverse, and they each have Poisson arrival rates of IF over Q or IR over Q. So we say that the total noise is equal to 2q times i forward plus i reverse times delta f, which is equal to 2q times the total current in the transistor, which is the saturated current times one plus e to the minus vds over phi t. That's normally a minus sign. In this case, it's a plus uh, sign because we're dealing with the um, um, uh, noise terms here. So what does this expression mean? Uh, it means basically that if we are in saturation, VDS is much larger than phi t, and as a result that term goes away, and the noise variance of a subthreshold transistor is really just 2qi. Now if we are in triode mode, then we actually start to add the second exponential function. Uh, normally we, we subtract it, uh, in this case we add it, which means that the noise in triode region is actually gonna be higher than it is in saturation. Again, all of this is in subthreshold. So this slide just shows ex exactly what we said here. So once the drain to source voltage of our transistor is above say about 100 millivolts at room temperature, we say we are saturated in the subthreshold regime and if the drain to source voltage is less than about 100 millivolts at room temperature, 
we say we are approximately or we're in you know the triode regime in our subthreshold transistor okay now normally when we're building amplifiers and so on we're operating in uh, subthreshold in the saturation region so we typically just ignore that one plus e uh, exponential term and we just say the the noise current in a subthreshold MOSFET is equal to 2qi now note that this does depend on the operating point right so the more current you push through your transistor the more noise current variance it will have uh, but as we'll see later the input referred noise will typically go down uh, depending on how you um, design your amplifier in terms of a small signal circuit model, we can treat the subthreshold MOSFET just as we normally do. It has dependent generators, RO, it could have capacitors that we could, could include here as well. And then all we do is we add an additional current source generator whose value is equal to 2QI, uh, whose variance value, I should say, is equal to 2QI. Note that RO does, is, is not a physical resistor, it's a model, uh, and as a result, it doesn't generate noise on its own. Okay, so let's take a look at the noise in a, an above threshold MOSFET. Now in an above threshold MOSFET, the current uh, is actually dominated by drift. Uh, however, uh, noise is coming from diffusion. And if we assume that the electric fields are relatively small, there's no velocity saturation and so on, then we can make some fairly similar derivations to what we did for the resistor. Um, and uh, as it turns out, uh, you know, you can you can look at section 7.5 in the book if you want more details. We don't have time uh, to do this full derivation, but basically what you would do is you would model it in the same way as you model the above threat or sorry the sub threshold um, uh, noise current. In this case, I like to have I, I sometimes like to put in a current source with a bidirectional arrow. Uh, just to indicate that, hey, this is noise. Uh, we don't actually care about the polarity um, because everything gets squared in the end anyways. So anyways, if you follow the derivation in se section 7.5 in the book, you get the expression equal to 4kt times gamma times gm times delta f. Uh, now one note that this gamma is confusingly not the body effect coefficient. Okay, that's a that's a little confusing, uh, but um, you know we run out of variables sometimes. Where we say that gamma is equal to two thirds for long channel devices. Okay, and when I mean long channel devices, I'm talking about like you know five micron devices or something ancient technology which is a little unfortunate because if you read the textbooks today, they often still say gamma is equal to two thirds, which is just not even close to true anymore. Uh, but you know, it still is just a coefficient. You can find it for your uh, technology that you're using. We say it is much higher in short channel devices. So for example, and I wouldn't, uh, I mean, technically this is co considered to be a sort channel device. Gamma is equal to about 2.5 in what I still consider to be an ancient technology, uh, 0.25 micron CMOS or 250 nanometer CMOS. Uh, keep in mind that we are in much lower single digit nanometers uh, today. Okay, but anyways, if you're gonna do analysis with above threshold MOSFETs, all you have to do is add this uh, current source generator, 4kT gamma times gm times delta f. So another a very important source of noise that we need to discuss uh, in this course uh, and in this lecture is called flicker noise, uh, otherwise known as one over f noise or pink noise. Now what happens here is that when we fabricate the gate of our MOSFET, uh, it has some sort of dielectric layer between the, the gate and, and the channel. And that dielectric layer is not perfect. Uh, and as a result, charge carriers, electrons, for example, uh, when, they're, when they're passing through the, the channel, 
uh, or under the gate. Uh, if we're in sub-threshold, I suppose there's not a, a strongly inverted channel here. Either way, when they're, when they're passing through the channel, they can sometimes get trapped into the gate oxide, stay there for a little while, eventually pop out and, and move on their merry way. So this ends up adding some, some stochasticity to the resulting currents that flow through our MOSFETs, uh, which introduces a noise. And it turns out that the amount of noise this introduces is inversely proportional to frequency. So as we go lower and lower in frequency, we get more and more noise. Now I should mention that the shot noise behavior that, that we studied for subthreshold MOSFETs, resistors, and so on, that's fundamental to the device operation. There's, there's no way that we can get around this. Physics does not allow this. Flicker noise, on the other hand, is not fundamentally needed. If we could develop a perfect oxide with no defects, no traps, then we would have no flicker noise. But in practice, it's extraordinarily difficult to do something like this. And as a result, all of our MOSFETs have it. And interestingly, one over F noise is actually ubiquitous. We see it everywhere uh, from our, our MOSFETs to um, nerve membranes, heartbeats, earthquakes, and so on. We can measure one over F noise in all of these things. Okay, so we call it one over F noise because, well, it has a one over F shape, right? So at lower and lower in frequencies, we get more and more noise. Um, at some point, the noise will decrease beyond which it becomes negligible. We call this the corner frequency. And we say it's negligible because it becomes lower than the white or the thermal noise uh, that's, uh, that's in your circuit here. Um, and so, you know, beyond that corner frequency, we don't have to worry about it too much. Now, depending on the type of MOSFET, its size and so on, we can say that the corner frequency can be anywhere from a few hundred hertz all the way to megahertz, uh, depending on, you know, many things. So here's the final circuit model for a transistor, whether we're in sub-threshold or above threshold. Our uh, small signal model, all we have to do is add an additional current source generator, and that will um, you know, correspond to all of the noise generated in the circuit uh, with respect to the following expression. If we are in above threshold, we get 4 kT gamma times gm times delta f plus k sub f gm squared over W times L times C ox times F times delta F. We'd say this is for above threshold. Okay, uh, the second term is the flicker noise term. As you can see here, there is an F in the expression for flicker noise, one over F specifically. Okay, uh, for sub threshold, it's equal to 2Q ID sat times one plus e to the minus vds over phi t uh, plus uh, it turns out that the one over f noise formula is the same in sub threshold as it is in above threshold now this would be for sub threshold okay um, so if we want to have low noise what do we want to do at least in terms of flicker noise is we typically want a very big device KF is a process parameter. We don't really have much control over this. Uh, we want a large W, a large L, um, and, and, and that will help uh, reduce the amount of flicker noise. So let's talk about low noise design. Uh, and I wanna make a, a, a clarification here because some people uh, don't understand or appreciate this based on some of the academic literature in this space. In older technologies, uh, and my rough line in the sand here is before 0.18 micron. We tended to use N-type polysilicon as the gate for both NMOS and PMOS transistors. And as a result for a PMOS transistor, because we have N-type polysilicon, there's a little bit of a mismatch here. And so when the channel was formed in the PMOS transistor, it was formed a little bit underneath the top of the, um, um, you know, no, right next to the dielectric, let's say. It's a little underneath the dielectric. It's away from the gate. Um, so as a result, PMOS devices in these older technologies tended to have lower 1 over F noise simply because the charge carriers were being uh, passed through uh, further away from the gate dielectric. 
In newer technologies, we're either using P-type polysilicon for PMOS transistors or a metal. Um, and, and as a result, we don't have this buried channel anymore. And so therefore there's no noise advantage for an NMOS over a PMOS transistor in you know, these uh, 180 nanometer uh, technologies and, and better. As we mentioned earlier, larger devices, physically larger devices has, have less one over F noise. BJTs and JFETs have less one over F noise th th than MOSFETs because they don't have the same trapping phenomena. Uh, there are other ways that we can use to reduce the effects of one over F noise. We're going to be discuss the technique of chopping uh, in a lot of detail um, in a later lecture. And I should also note that purely reactive elements, so inductors and capacitors, do not exhibit noise. And small signal resistances like RO, for example, do not exhibit noise either. These are just um, you know, models, not physical resistors. So one question, if one over F noise really does increase with decreasing frequency, does that mean that as we take the limit of frequency going all the way to zero, we take a truly, truly, truly DC measurement, do we really have infinite noise? Does that make sense? Okay, so let's do a, a quick analysis here. Uh, we know that the uh, noise variance is proportional to the integral from some low frequency to some high frequency of 1 over f df. Okay, so the, the integral of a 1 over x function is a natural logarithm, and if we plug in the, the bounds of the equation, uh, we get the following natural logarithm. Okay, so if the lower bound frequency indeed goes to um, zero, then indeed the noise variance will go to infinity. Okay, so, so that is true. However, it's true theoretically. Let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at the noise power spectral density, frequency on the x-axis and variance on the y-axis. And I'm gonna plot this on a log-log scale so it's a straight line. So I'm here at 100 hertz, here's 10 hertz, here's one hertz, and you know it just kind of keeps on going this way. So it turns out that the noise contribution from 100 hertz to 10 hertz is actually equal uh, in magnitude to the noise contribution from 10 hertz to 1 hertz, which is equal to the noise contribution from 1 hertz to 0.1 hertz, and so on and so forth. Okay, so each decade of frequency we go down in, we will get the equivalent amount of noise as we got from the previous decade. All right, so. Let's just do a quick thought experiment here. If the original MOSFET uh, which was fabricated in 1959, uh, if the original MOSFET from 1959 was left on until today, someone turned it on in 1959 and never turned it off and we're measuring it over this entire time it would have 3x, the 1 over f noise, as a device that was reset 10 seconds ago. Uh, over a, um, we'll say that's measured over a one kilohertz bandwidth. Okay, so technically, yes, if you could average uh, for infinite uh, uh, time uh, from the beginning of the universe until now, uh, or until the end of the universe, I suppose I should say, then yeah, you'll get infinite one over F noise. Uh, but in practice, you just can't measure things long enough to, to make this a, a really big deal. Even if you measure it over 50, 60 years, um, you're still not gonna have that much more noise than if you just picked up a device right now and measured it.
Okay, so you know something to, to keep in mind. So this is just for fun. We, we you know, on the, I believe this is from the Sarpeshkar text as well. Uh, you can actually get uh, real measurement data from this. So this is a device that they turned on for six months and, and measured the the noise power spectral density, uh, and and you can see a very kind of clear one over f shape here. It turns out it's one over f to the 1.2, but you know, close enough. And uh, yeah, it just keeps on keeps on going uh, if you measure for longer and longer periods of time. Uh, but again, I want to still emphasize that the probability density function, uh, the PDF, is still Gaussian. This is still a Gaussian random variable that, that that's going on here. So when we're talking about noise, it's important to make sure that we can compare noise between different uh, circuits on a level playing field. Uh, so if we have two amplifiers, say, and they have output referred noise uh, or noise measured at the output of the circuit of 10 microvolt RMS over 100 hertz of bandwidth versus one microvolt RMS, you might say, oh, well, that first uh, or that second amplifier with one microvolt RMS over 100 hertz of bandwidth is much better. But that's not a good apples to apples comparison because we don't really know how much gain either of these amplifiers have. If, if the first amplifier had a gain, uh, you know, had, had a large gain, um, then it's natural it's going to have a large output referred noise, right? If it has a low gain and the second amplifier has a high gain, then clearly that second amplifier is actually a better circuit. So the right way to handle this is to do a process called input referred noise analysis. What we do here is we take all of the noise sources at the output or in our circuit. We observe what the total output noise is because that is what is measurable from our circuit. You can't actually physically measure input referred noise. You take the total noise measured at the output of your circuit or analyzed at the output of your circuit if you're doing this analytically. And then you divide by the square of the transfer function to refer it back to the input. Uh, so in other words, you replace the circuit with a noiseless circuit and your noise sources at the input. And if those noise sources go through the transfer function of your circuit, you should get the same output referred noise. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful about what we mean by transfer function here in order for the noise referral steps to work out correctly. Uh, but I think you get the idea. So the steps here are to draw a small signal circuit model include all of your noise sources. And then uh, let's do some noise analysis. Let's assume that all independent uh, sources are uh, you know, sh uh, shorted or open, depending if they're voltages or current sources. And then use superposition analysis. Find the transfer function from each noise source to the output. We, we then, through superposition analysis, add up all of the sources at the output and then to refer and make sure again we're we're multiplying by the square of the transfer functions in each case to make sure we're dealing with the appropriate power units and then refer back to the input by dividing by the square of the gain of the circuit okay so if that sounds complicated let's go through a, a brief example that should uh, show that this is not that complicated once you do the steps so let's do the uh, noise calculation for a common source amplifier uh, that is loaded by a resistor. In this case, there are two sources of noise. There's the noise in the transistor, which could be an above or sub threshold. And there's the noise in the resistor. And what we want to do is we want to refer this to the input. So we'll call this VN comma in squared uh, bar. Okay, so this is the input referred noise. So what we can say here is that the input referred noise is equal to the output referred noise divided by the transfer function. So what is the transfer function to go from an input voltage to an output current? Well, that's just the transconductance of the device. So to get the input referred noise, we would take our NMOS noise current and we would divide by the square of its transfer function to get to the input, which is just GM squared. Pretty simple. And for the resistor, uh, it has its own noise source and we have to divide this by the transfer function from an input voltage to an output voltage, when, which in this case is just uh, GM uh, R L squared. 
Okay, now we're going to go ahead and assume that the noise sources are uncorrelated, which is generally a good assumption uh, because these noise sources are coming from two different circuit elements and different circuit elements usually have uncorrelated noise properties. So let's go ahead and analyze the noise in an actual circuit here. Okay, so in part A, I'm showing the actual circuit. We have some voltage source that's uh, um, you know, being exercised across a resistor and a capacitor, and the output voltage is, is seen at the output of the capacitor. In order to figure out what the total noise in the circuit is, we have to uh, replace the resistor with an ideal resistor and a noise generator. In this case, we'll just call it VN for simplicity. Uh, and then do our superposition analysis, the DC component of Vn is neglected. Okay, so um, the total output referred noise, V out, of omega, um, or sorry, the total, the, sorry, the output voltage in the frequency domain is equal to 1 over 1 plus J omega RC times Vn. Right, this is just a simple uh, first order low pass filter, first order RC low pass filter. So that is the output voltage. And then what we can do is we can find the output noise variance uh, with respect to omega, which is just the, the noise variance of the resistor uh, times the square of the transfer function, uh, which is just one over one plus J omega RC absolute value all squared here. And so we can say V out, the total integrated noise is the integral of this function from zero to infinity. Uh, we can replace V in, and that's just four KT R DF over one plus omega squared R squared C squared. Okay, so we can go ahead and do this integral. Um, you may not recall what the integral of uh, one over one plus x squared is. Uh, again, omega is part of f. You have to do f to, to v uh, or omega to v f to tr translation. So you can go ahead and do this integral. I'm going to tell you the answer, but I'm going to tell you the answer in steps. Uh, it is equal to four ktr. That just pops out times one over two pi RC times pi over two. Okay, so it turns out that this is actually very easy to remember. So you don't have to remember how to do this nasty integral. This is literally just the three dB bandwidth of your filter. And this is, um, well, we'll explain what it is on the, on the next slide. It, it's basically the fact that at the 3 dB bandwidth has some um, uh, filtering already happening. Uh, and so you just need to extend the bandwidth a little bit, in this case by pi over two, in order to come up with a brick wall filter that has the same integrated energy as this actual filter function. But what's more interesting, and I want to analyze on, on this circuit, uh, on this slide here, is that if you kind of uh, cancel out the pies and, the, and, and everything else, you get an answer that is equal to kT divided by c. Okay, so this is really interesting. The noise in this circuit is coming from the resistor. The resistor is the one generating the noise. The capacitor does not generate any noise. And yet the total integrated noise at the output of the circuit is independent of the value of the resistance. How does that make sense? If the value of the resistor goes up, then 4 KTR must go up, and so we must get more noise. And indeed that's true, but the bandwidth of the circuit also shrinks because the bandwidth is related to uh, the RC time constant. Right, and so these things end up canceling out. So let's let's look at this in more detail on the next slide. So related to that point, we'll look at the second bullet point first. The integrated noise really does equal to KT over C, because if we have a large resistor, then we're gonna have large noise, but we're gonna have narrow bandwidth. And if we have a small resistor, we're gonna have lower noise, but a wider bandwidth. So these two things precisely cancel out, 
and as a result, the noise is the same. So in other words, if we have large noise, R, or sorry, if R goes up, then that means bandwidth goes down, and, well, KT over C remains the same. So it turns out that this is a somewhat similar phenomena to CV squared uh, dissipation in a um, switch capacitor circuit or a digital circuit. So even though the, the energy in a digital circuit is being consumed by a resistor, the amount of energy consumed in a digital circuit is independent of the value of the resistor. It's a very similar thing going on here. And then related to the top bullet, I said that uh, you know we can normally just uh, do this integral very easily by saying hey, it's just uh, you know a brick wall. You you model it as a brick wall filter, whose bandwidth is the normal 3 dB bandwidth times pi over two to take into account for the uh, gradual, not perfectly sharp roll off. Okay, let's look at a slightly more interesting circuit now. Let's look at the design of an operational transconductance amplifier. Now again, this is an OTA and not an op amp, which means that we are taking an input voltage differential and converting it into an output current. Uh, so as you may recall, the transconduct, and, and we're going to build this out of a, a five transistor circuit. This is a circuit that we've uh, looked at before. Uh, I believe we looked at the voltage uh, mode operation of this circuit, but we could also look at the uh, current mode operation of the circuit where the output is a current source. And in that particular case, we, we said that the overall transconductance of the circuit is just equal to the transconductance, at least to a first order, of the first uh, of the input differential pair. So what we'd like to do now is understand what is the total output referred noise, and then let's divide this by the overall gain of the circuit, in this case just the transconductance, um, in order to compute what the input referred noise is. Okay, so here is the small signal model of our OTA, and what I've done here is I've just replaced each transistor with its equivalent small signal model. I'm neglecting RO here. I'm not including any capacitors. I'm making this very simple. So there's a few simplifications I want to make before we uh, proceed. First is we can recognize that we have a dependent generator whose one terminal is ground and whose other terminal happens to be uh, dependent on said terminal. Uh, this is a diode connected device. Uh, and as a result, we can uh, just replace its uh, dependent generator with a 1 over GM resistor. Uh, I should also mention the bottom two transistors. We've replaced them with current or dependent current source generators that are GS times VGS, where GS is GM plus GMB. And we can do this because for the purposes of noise analysis, we are grounding all of our inputs and outputs uh, for that matter. Uh, and so as a result, there's no VG term to worry about, it's just the VS term. Now to make the analysis a little simpler, I'm going to do something a little funky here. I'm gonna separate uh, this uh, dependent generator into a one over GS resistor and an IX current source. And, and I'll show you what I mean uh, on the next slide. If you don't believe me that this works out, well, you could try the analysis yourself and convince yourself that indeed this is functionally equivalent uh, circuit diagram. Uh, it's not obvious why it works, uh, but if you do the, the analysis, you'll, you'll see that they're exactly uh, mathematically equivalent. And this just makes our life an easier analysis wise. We'll also do the same thing for the other, uh, uh, um, for the other GS source. So after simplification, we get the following circuit model. So again, this is this um, G1 over GS resistor with, a, with an IX current source, uh, where the current flowing through this 1 over GS resistor basically just ends up flowing back into the, the other side of the terminal. So I suppose you can see how it, how it makes sense. So uh, the steps for computing what the input referred noise is, is we first want to do superposition analysis and find the transfer function from each of these individual noise sources to the output. Uh, 
add all of these components up, again multiplying by the square of the transfer functions, and then dividing by the gain to get back to the input uh, for our input referred noise contribution. So let's go ahead and do the superposition analysis for each and every one of these uh, current sources. So let's start with the contribution from transistor M0. Now this resistor is equal to one over GS. Um, and so I0 sees two resistors, both equal to one over GS. And so therefore we have current that basically gets split between these two paths, I0 over two. Let's write down a better two. I0 over two in that way. Okay, Ix is being generated across one over Gs, so that current there flows over here. This is I0 over two. There's nowhere else for this current to flow other than across this current mirror transistor, uh, which means that the uh, current over here is equal to I0 over two. Okay. Now, likewise, the Ix2 current uh, throwing through, through this one over Gs resistor is flowing through this way. So this is I zero over two. And if you look at I out, I out, well, this current here actually just flows right up into that current there. And so as a result, none of this current goes to the output. So I out is just equal to zero. So what this means is that M zero contributes no noise to the output. Therefore, H zero of S is equal to zero. Now, again, this is an approximation. We haven't included our O in this, in this uh, model here. And if we do, then you will get a small amount of, of contribution here, but this is a good first order model. It gives us a lot of good insight that we'll, that we'll use moving forward. So let's now go to transistor M1. Uh, remember, this is a 1 over Gs resistor, and we now have tr a current flowing through I1. So this current gets split into two pieces because it's seeing equal resistors on either side, I1 over 2. So I1 over 2 gets generated through this guy, um, through the 1 over Gs resistor, which creates Ix1, which flows through the current mirror transistor Im, which generates this current flowing over here. I1 over 2. So far, this side of the circuit is exactly the same. But on this side of the circuit, uh, we actually get um, current flowing. Um, let's see here. Um, yeah, actually, sorry, I spoke a little too quickly. So we have I1 over 2 flowing this direction, but we have I1 flowing here in this branch here. So as a result, we have a current flowing in this direction of I1 over two, which means that we have current flowing in this direction of I1 over two. So sorry, that's a little bit different than, than the previous branch. Now we have um, I1 over two flowing through the IX2 branch. So we have I1 over two flowing this way. So as it turns out, these currents just add up and I out is equal to I1. Okay, so we say I out is equal to I1. So therefore the transfer function H1 of S is just equal to one. Okay, very nice, easy, simple to analyze transfer function. So we can now do the analysis for M2. Uh, as it turns out, the analysis is the same as it was for M1. So we say H2 of S is equal to one. Okay, very simple. Now let's analyze uh, transistor M3. Uh, in this case, there's, there's no sources attached to this bottom circuit, so this isn't doing anything. Therefore, these two current sources aren't doing anything either. The only place that there's an independent generator is over here that generates current that flows through this way, which flows this way over here. So therefore, I out is equal to minus I3. So we can say here is therefore the absolute value of H3 of S is just equal to one. Likewise for M4, there's no current flowing over here. So these guys are all zero. This is zero. Um, 
therefore that's zero and all of the current flows to the output, so therefore the output is equal to I4. So we can say is H4 of S is equal to one. Okay, so that turned out to be super easy. The transfer function of all of our current sources uh, to the output is just equal to one, uh, with the exception of transistor M0, whose transfer function was equal to zero. So what we can do now is compute the total output referred current noise. We multiply the current generated in each transistor, which we assume is, is all the same. It's equal to I bias over two. Well, except for transistor M0, which is I bias, but its transfer function is zero, so it doesn't really matter. So we have um, transfer functions of one. We square it, which is again, just one. We add them all up. That's all equal to four. And it turns out that all of their current source, no the, the noise sources for all these transistors are the same. It's 2Q I bias over two. So we add that all up and we get a, a, an equation that looks something like this after a little bit of simplification. The total output referred current noise is 8KTN times GM one or two. Uh, this is of course assuming white noise only. We are not taking into account flicker noise here. In order to get the total input referred noise, we take the output referred current noise and we divide by the transfer function squared. In this case, the transfer function is just equal to GM. So we divide by GM squared, so we get 8KTN GM divided by GM, which basically means it's 8KTN over GM. Uh, also, um, in the book, they call it, uh, they do other simplifications. They say 16N squared times KT over Q or phi T, in other words, squared times Q over IB times delta F. That's what they um, end up deriving in the book, but uh, the answer is effectively the same. So what does this mean? It means that if we want a lower input referred noise, we must have more transconductance, which means that if we're in subthreshold, we want more current flowing through the device. So this is self-consistent with what I was saying earlier, that we really want more current flowing through our device in order to get lower input referred noise. This is a fundamental trade-off uh, with these types of amplifiers. Let's go ahead and take the final step in this lecture and derive what the total noise in an actual circuit is. What we just, just derived here is the input referred noise of the OTA just kind of sitting on its own in the ether. But let's say we wanna bring it into a, a circuit, let's say a, a GMC filter. Okay, so here's a GMC filter. We can very quickly derive the transfer function for this. The difference between V in on the positive terminal and the negative terminal of this transconductor, which happens to be connected to V out, times GM gives you the current I out. The current uh, is equal to the output voltage divided by the um, impedance of the capacitor, which is one over FC, so it's SC times V out. So we can use this to solve for the transfer function between V out and V in which is just one over one plus S times C over GM. So in other words, this is just a first order low pass filter. But we can go ahead and do the analysis for noise here. We know the total input referred noise of our transconductor amplifier. And now it's being filtered by you know, this filter that we've designed. So let's go ahead and do this noise analysis now. We say that the output referred noise is equal to the input referred noise passed through the, the square of the transfer function, which I've written here. Now you'll recall this input referred noise is equal to four times two Q times IB over two divided by GM squared. That was the input referred noise. And now it's being filtered. Uh, so the, in order to get the, the answer here, we multiply by one over two pi. This is to go from radians to, to Hertz. We multiply by pi over two. This is the uh, bandwidth expansion as we did earlier when we were doing a um, first order low pass filter. And then we multiply by GM over C. And this is you know, the 3 dB bandwidth. Uh, 
So there are a lot of terms in here. A lot of them will cancel. If you go ahead and do all of that cancellation, you'll find that this is equal to 2n times kt over c. So that's actually quite interesting. Um, this is an active GMC filter, and the noise contributed within this filter is coming from the op amp but the amount of noise that ends up getting to the output is actually independent of the noise generated by the op amp. Um, there is uh, an extra component here, which we call the excess noise factor. Uh, and it's just because the op amp effectively generates more noise than an equivalent sized resistor would for, for the equivalent uh, amount of filter bandwidth. So why would you ever do this? Uh, well, uh, you would do it because A, the transconductor offers some isolation. You can control very easily the amount of GM by controlling the current uh, in your circuit. Uh, and so there's some nice properties uh, for, for doing it this way. Okay, um, so I think that will conclude uh, this lecture on noise. We're gonna take the lessons learned uh, from this uh, lecture and use it towards building things like instrumentation amplifiers low noise instrumentation amplifiers for biomedical applications in future lectures.